Hello, what's up everybody? My name is Carlos Vitrago Pinzon, RTRVI. Welcome back to my channel, Lazy Bones Radiology. In today's episode, I'll be covering the x-ray productions within the x-ray tube. But before we start, don't forget to press that like button, subscribe to the channel, and share with your friends so we can all learn together. Let's begin. The history of x-rays. X-rays were discovered in November 8th, 1895. This is a very important date that you must remember. And the father of x-rays was William Comrad Rankin. While he was working with cathode rays, he noticed a green light projecting into a nearby fluorescent screen. Unable to explain the type of light that was being emitted, Dr. Rankin labeled it as X, light rays, because X means unknown. This is where the name x-rays come from. Using this mysterious light, Dr. Rankin noticed that bones were able to be seen, and the first recorded x-ray photograph was of his wife's hand, as you can see here on the right hand side. Now let's begin with the x-ray tube. As you can see here, this is an image of an x-ray tube. While I was learning how to remember the parts, I used to draw a line in between them, as you can see here. The reason I like to draw a line in between the tube is because I like to separate the two main parts. The cathode, which is the negative side of the x-ray tube, and the anode, which is the positive side of the x-ray tube. Do not mix these up. Surrounding the cathode and anode, this is known as a glass envelope. This helps structure the x-ray tube and also maintain a vacuum within the tube. Now let's talk about parts within the cathode. The focusing cup. Next is the cathode filament, which is within the focusing cup. Now let's jump back into the anode side. This is known as a window. Next is the tungsten target. And right behind it, this is known as a spinning anode. Lastly, the rotor. I'm briefly covering the different parts of the x-ray tube so you can have a basic knowledge of how the x-ray tube is set up. Now let's begin with the x-ray production. First we start with thermionic admission. This is the emission of electrons from the heated metal within the filament or the focusing cup inside of the cathode. This is referred to as boiling of the electrons. As the electrons are boiled off, they form an electron cloud. This is known as a space charge. As you can see here on the right hand side, this is a picture of the focusing cup. And the coils in between it are known as a filament, which are made out of tungsten and 1-2% to thorium. The reason why we use tungsten is because it has a very high melting point and does not vaporize easily. And the reason why we use thorium is because it's a radioactive element that helps release electrons. Now let's look at how thermotic emission works. As the filaments start heating up, they start releasing electrons. When you have a sufficient amount of electrons or the satisfied amount that you want, this is known as the electron cloud or the space charge. Once we have the satisfied amount of electrons, we accelerate the electrons using a current in order to hit the anode. This is where the x-rays happen. This brings us to the x-ray production. In the x-ray tube, there are two ways the x-rays are produced. There's the characteristic interactions and the Brenchelung or Brenz interactions. 99% of the interactions only produce heat. This is known as heat production, while only 1% of the interactions result in making x-rays. Let's begin with heat production. As the boiled off electrons from the focusing cup are accelerated towards the anode, majority of the electrons interact with the outer shell electrons of the tungsten atoms. These incoming filament electrons do not have enough kinetic energy to ionize the atom, but they do have enough energy to rise the atom's energy level. This rise of energy is called excitation. Immediately after, the excess energy is released as infrared radiation or heat and the outer shell electrons return back to normal. This energy absorption and heat release cycle makes up 99% of all the interactions that happen throughout the collision. Very important, no x-rays are produced during heat production, only heat release. Now let's look at how heat production is formed. As you can see, this is a tungsten atom. As the incoming electron or the incoming filament electron enters the outer shell electrons, this causes the energy level of the atom to increase. This is known as excitation. Immediately after, the incoming filament electron leaves the atom, which causes a release of energy. This is known as heat release or heat production. But remember, it's very important. No extras are formed during heat production, only the release of heat. 
Now let's move on to characteristic interactions. This interaction happens when the filament electron collides or strikes the inner shell electrons of the tungsten atom. Once the collision occurs, if the incoming filament electron has more kinetic energy than the bonding energy of the inner shell electrons, ionization of the atom occurs. This is roughly 69.5 keV and above. Ionization means that the atom loses an electron which causes the charge to change, so it is no longer neutral. This ejection of the inner shell electron causes a cascade among the rest of the electrons in the atom. In other words, the vacant space in the inner shell causes the neighboring electrons to start traveling towards the center. As the electrons jump from shell to shell, energy is released known as photons. These are the x-ray photons that we use in our field. Each photon releases a specific amount of energy depending on the binding energy of the electron that's being transferred from. But for now, electron shell values and calculations of photon energies will be discussed in just a few moments. It is very important that you pay attention of how the interactions happen first so the calculations can make better sense. Now let's look at how characteristic interactions work. The incoming filament electron strikes an inner shell electron of the tungsten atom. This causes the electron to be ejected, which is known as an ejected orbital electron, and the filament electron continues on this path. This collision causes a space or vacant spot inside of the inner shell of the tungsten atom. This vacancy causes the tungsten atom to have a change in charge. In order to maintain balance, neighboring electrons shift towards the center in order to maintain balance. This releases an energy known as a photon. As one electron travels towards the center, the vacant spot moves from the center to the outer shells because the electrons keep shifting towards the center. Every time there's a shift, a photon is released. This is known as a characteristic cascade. Now that you have a basic knowledge of how the characteristic interactions work, let's talk about the electron energy values. In radiology, the innermost electron shell is known as a K shell. And as you can see here on the right hand side, the rest of the other shells are named consecutive to the alphabet. The K shell has the strongest bonding energy because it's the closest to the atom's nucleus. This table here on the right hand side shows you how each level gets weaker and weaker as it gets away from the nucleus. The farther the electron is to the nucleus, the weaker the binding or the attraction energy of the orbital electron has. In our field, the K and L photons are the only ones that have enough energy to escape the X-ray tube. And a little side note, KeV means kiloelectron volts. Now let's look at some examples using the knowledge we just learned. An incoming filament electron, for example, has 100 KeV and it strikes an inner shell electron. The filament electron after the collision will have a 30.5 KeV remaining energy. Because remember, the inner shell electrons has 69.5 keV bonding energy. As you can see, if you add the filament electron after the collision and the ejected electron energies together, they both equal to 100 keV. Remember, energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Now let's look at some examples. If a K-shell electron has been ejected, here's some examples of different types of electrons that can be transferred from the L, M, N, and O shells. The further the electron has to jump, the more KeV the photon is gonna have. And here's some calculations if there's a vacancy in the L shell. As the vacancies get further from the center, the photon energies become weaker and weaker. Shell calculations above the M shell create photons that are so small that we really don't calculate them because they're less than one KeV. But it's very important that you understand how every electron, as it jumps from outer to inner, there is a change in energy, and this releases an X-ray photon that we use in our field in order to capture our images. It's simpler than it looks. As the electrons travel from outer to inner shells, the change in electrons' energy releases a photon. Now let's move on to Brunkster-Long interactions. Bremsstrahlung is a German word for breaking or slowing down radiation. This interaction happens when a filament electron misses all the orbital electrons and interacts with the nucleus of the target atom. 
the filament electron travels towards the nucleus and diverts to another direction. The closer the electron is to the nucleus, the stronger the attraction force from the positively charged nucleus. As the filament electron travels closer to the nucleus, its momentum slows down because of the strong attraction force, as you can see here on the right hand side. These Bram interactions happen when the filament electron has less than 69.5 keV. As the kinetic energy of the electron slows down and changes direction, it loses energy which is known as a Bremsstrahlung photon. Now let's look at an example. As the incoming filament electron enters the inner shells of the, of the atom, it misses all of the orbiting electrons. The reason why it misses is because the majority of the orbiting electrons are constantly moving, which forms empty space around the atom. So as the incoming electron gets closer to the nucleus, the positive and energy attraction causes the electron to change its course. As the electron changes course, this releases energy known as the Bremsstrahlung or Bren's photon. But majority of the time, the incoming filaments interact with the outer shells of the atom. This time, the filament electron doesn't have enough energy to get close to the nucleus. The further the electron is from the nucleus, the smaller in change of the direction of the electron. This causes the Brem photon to have weaker energy. Well, let's do some calculations. High energy filament electron enters the inner shell electrons and causes a sharp turn because of the stronger attraction from the nucleus. This makes a high energy photon or Brem photon. So our equation is incoming minus exit equals the Brem photon value. So if you had a 100 keV incoming filament electron and the exit energy level was 30, the Brem photon level will be a 70 keV. So now let's practice this one. If you have a 100 keV incoming filament electron and your Brem photon level is 80, what is the exit filament electron energy level? it will be 20 keV in the exit value. Now let's try this one. If you have an exit value of 15 and your Brem photon level is 85, what would be the incoming filament electron energy? It will be 100. Because remember, exit plus Brem equals incoming. Very simple math, do not overthink it. Now let's practice with a low energy filament electron. As a low energy filament electron, travels and enters the electron cloud, the further away from the nucleus, the smaller the change in path, the weaker the photon. Same equation, incoming minus exit equals the Brem photon value. So if you have a 50 keV and the exit filament energy level is 30, the difference between them will equal the Brem photon energy, which is 20. So now let's practice. If you have a 60 keV incoming filament energy level, and you have a 10 Brem photon energy level, what will be your exit filament energy level? It'll be 50. Now let's try the opposite. If you have an exit of 20 keV and the Brem photon energy level is 5 keV, what is your incoming filament electron energy level? It'll be 25. Because remember, exit plus Brem equals incoming. The calculations are very simple. So remember, do not overthink them. Studying how the interactions happen within the atom and the calculations will be easier. This is how I studied and how I practiced for my registry. The combination of Bremsstrahlung and characteristic photons are what make the X-ray beam. These X-ray photons are released from the interactions from the tungsten atoms in the anode target disc, which is approximately 0.5 millimeters within the disc. The X-ray beam is made of from various energy level photons. As you can see here on this chart, I made the line where 69.5, this is where characteristics interactions happen and any interactions underneath this line are more Brem interactions or photon releases. Now let's look at some examples. The lower the KV the electron has, the higher probability of Brem photons to be released. Because remember, 69.5 is the binding energy of a K-shell, 
which causes the cascade, or photons to be released, of the K-shell of the tungsten atom. So no characteristic interactions will happen if you're lower than the 69.5 keV minimum. Now let's look at a higher keV electron. The higher the energy level of the electron, the more probability of characteristic photons to be released. But at the same time, Bremster lung interactions happen as well. With every exposure, both interactions happen at the same time. The only thing that distinguishes the amount of characteristic in Bremster lung photons to be released is the amount of keV the filament electron has during the impact. As the X-ray photons are released from the vacuum glass envelope, the low energy photons are absorbed by the inherited filtration, which is 2.5 millimeters of aluminum inside of the X-ray tube. Only the X-ray photons that are strong enough to escape the tube are known as a primary beam. There is some scatter or off-focus radiation that doesn't contribute to the primary beam. But modern day X-ray tubes have limited the amount of off-focus radiation. Now let's look at the example of the entire picture. As the projecting filament electrons travel from the cathode to the anode, they strike the tungsten target disk, which causes the interactions, heat production, BREM, and characteristics to happen at the same time. As the photons are released, majority of them are absorbed through the inherited filtration, and majority of the interactions, or 99%, are known as heat production, which are absorbed in the oil that's surrounding the entire x-ray tube. In the next videos, I'll be talking about how the photons released from the x-ray tube interact inside of the body and form our x-ray pictures. Remember to review the interactions and remember to practice, practice, practice. Everything builds on top of each other. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you learned a lot and took lots of notes. Don't forget to press the like button, subscribe to the channel, and share with your friends so we can all learn together. You can also follow me on LazyBones underscore radiology and on Twitter on LazyBonesRadio1. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye.